we still have one or two people that are attempting to join in, uh, but we're going to go ahead and let them catch up with us. Uh, so welcome to Construction Training Tuesday. My name is Adam Trzvinski, and I work with the Construction Resource Team here with First Guarantee Mortgage. So today we are going to be covering the one-time close construction to perm loans. Now, keep in mind, this is an overview. This is not designed to turn you into a product expert, uh, but uh, this hopefully will give you a better overview about how the product works within First Guarantee system. Uh, a couple little housekeeping notes from today. So number one, if your email address is not already in your GoToMeeting profile, please make sure that you send that to me in a private message. That way I can send out all of the follow-up information. Once we finish up today, you guys are going to get a copy of the presentation uh, as well as a copy of the recorded video. Uh, <clears throat> you're also going to get uh, tons of documents and tools that go along with this program as well as some nice training guides. So if your email address is not already in there, please make sure that you send that to me at some point during the presentation. Uh, the second thing is you will notice that everybody today is on mute. Obviously this is to cut down on the background noise. So if you do have any questions during the presentation, please make sure that you use the chat box found in your GoToMeeting window. Uh, I will stop from time to time to address any questions that may come through uh, so we can get those cleared up for you. You don't need to hold on to them until the very end of the presentation. I will stop occasionally and address those for you. So today we are going to be talking about the program development the construction resource team, which is my group here, and how we play within the transactions, some of the loan administration pieces that we've come up with, some of the solutions that were, uh, allow us to partner in the transaction with you, and then hopefully by the end of this presentation, you're going to have a little bit better understanding of how the one-time close program works. First of all, we're going to start off with a definition here. It is a single loan used to either purchase or refinance the purchase of a lot or the, the, the ownership of a lot and include the building of a home. So just like the name indicates, it is only underwritten once, it is closed, we do the administration for the construction phase after that, and then it converts into a permanent loan. One thing that you do need to know is that there is another program out there referred to as a two-time close. <clears throat> now a two-time close is a little bit riskier product. It is one that we actually don't offer here at First Guarantee because there are some major differences between the one-time and the two-time, and that's what I'm going to show you. So on the two-time close, a couple things here. Uh, number one, there's no requalification on the one-time close. So what can happen on a two-time is you can actually qualify at the beginning, get all the way through the process of building your home, get to the very end, and then actually not qualify to move into your own home. So that is not actually an option on the one-time close. Since we only do this closing one time, uh, you only have to qualify one time. So it, that takes that little bit of risk out of the equation. There's also no need to update the documentation. It's less paperwork. Okay, basically on a two-time close, you have to submit an entire second package uh, to do the the second requalif or to do the requalification or the second approval. So no need to do that on the one time. Also, we don't need a new appraisal. Okay, so this is only done one time up front as a plans and specs appraisal. It is not reappraised at the end. <clears throat> so again, in terms of risk, there's no chance of that coming in with a shortage. So those are some of the benefits to doing the one-time close uh, versus the two-time. You can see that's why we offer the one-time close, is it is a little bit less risk-averse product. So during the process, there are a couple different ways that we protect the interest rate. Okay, that is the cap and float down and the straight extended lock. And we're going to talk more about those as we get into the parts and pieces. So next up, you're going to see kind of an overview. Uh, this is sort of a high-level look at how these files move through our system. So when it's initially received by FGMC, it's going to go to the construction resource team. Again, that's my group here. So we're going to do an initial review on these files. And this is where we're actually going to be looking for just some basic parts and pieces. Your loan builder, your contract, your land, lot agreement. Uh, we're going to dive into a little bit more about that as we, go, as we jump through here. But uh, we are looking just for some basic parts and pieces at this point. Now, once it clears that initial review, uh, it's going to go over to the underwriting stage of things. Now, there are actually about three steps to the underwriting process. The first is going to be the credit underwrite. Now, the credit underwrite should be pretty much business as usual. Really nothing different here. This is a standard credit underwrite for you guys. The second one is going to be the builder, I'm sorry, the uh, project review. Now, the project review is where we're actually going to dive into the details of this project. This is where we're going to find out, um, you know, all the, if all the numbers match, Numbers from contract, 1003, uh, cost estimate, cost breakdown. Make sure that we have everything addressed on there that we need. So to give you an example on that one, uh, if the builder had to put in well and septic, okay, because we know that there's no 
uh, public water and sewer on the property, then we need to make sure that well and septic was addressed on the bid and is currently in the project. Okay, so that's the kind of thing that we're looking for during the project review. Now the third one on there is a little bit different. Okay, builder acceptance is actually a little bit outside the norm because builder acceptance can actually be done at any time. It does not have to accompany a loan file. So what does that mean for you in the field? Well, that means that if you've got a builder that you're working with locally, maybe they want to use you as an exclusive lender. Number one, that's fantastic. But number two, what that's going to allow you to do is have that builder pre-accepted. So the next time, or the first time that you get a loan file from that particular builder, you actually won't have to go through this process again. So the builder acceptance process, once they're accepted into the system, uh, they're actually good for 12 months. So as long as we have a deal coming in within that time frame, you know, within every 12 months, basically all we're doing is updating the license and insurance. So if you want to go ahead and get that done, you can actually get that done as far ahead as you would like to if you know that you're going to be getting some business from that builder. Now, if it does exceed the 12 months, then uh, we will actually need to have them do another builder acceptance package. So again, you can do that at any time. It does not need to accompany a loan file. Now, it certainly can, but you are not required to send it in at the time of the loan file submission. You can have that done ahead of time. So from there, you're going to get your, you're going to get your conditions, and that can come from either the credit underwrite, the project underwrite, or the builder acceptance side of things. Okay, so you can get conditions from any of those. Those are going to get cleared to, uh, cleared to close, or sorry, those are going to get cleared up, and then you're going to receive your clear to close. We move into the closing at that point. So that is sort of a high level look. <clears throat> now we did have a question come in. As a correspondent, do we underwrite the credit package or no? We do not underwrite any part of the package. Uh, that is correct. Basically, if you're doing this as a non-delegated correspondent, you are going to originate, we are going to underwrite the file, and you are going to close it in your name. The difference being is that if it was submitted as a wholesale file, you would originate, we would underwrite, and then we, as FGMC, would close it in our name. So correspondent, no, you have no responsibility to do the underwriting on the file. So that gives you pretty much a high-level look at how these files move through our system. Now, the next four slides, if you took nothing else away from this training today, please make sure it is the next four slides. What you're looking at now is the one-time close scenario request form. The reason this is so important is that these basic questions, there's about seven questions on here, these basic questions are going to provide us with all of the detail that we need to structure this loan for you. Okay, This should always be step one. So basically, once the borrower meets with the builder, builds the house on paper, and they have some idea what their lot situation is going to be, either they have a lot that they're going to purchase and they know the purchase price, or they already have a lot and they know the approximate lien and approximate, and, uh, approximate value. They're going to, once the borrower knows those two things, you can then complete this form. Um, at that point, you should know the months to build. The builder probably has expressed how long it's going to take to build the home. One thing you may not know uh, that you may need to check with the builder or the borrower is how many draws the builder is expecting. The average is usually about five for a stick-built home, uh, a little bit less for the modulars and manufacturers. So filling this form out should always, always, always be step one. So you're going to fill this out and submit it to the construction resource team. A couple things that we need to know on here. Land details, kind of like I had stated already, but is it being purchased or is it already owned? If, you know, if they own it, how long have they owned it? Is there a lien and what is the approximate current value? Construction costs, this is what you need from the builder. Okay, and that should be everything that they need to build this home, including their material, labor, delivery, tie-down, setup, skirting, whatever it happens to be everything that they need to give that customer a key and move in. Keep in mind that this number should also include the builder's profit. If the, if the profit isn't shown, we don't know how to calculate for the profit. So <clears throat> when we get these construction costs, the profit should already be built in. Now, months to build, fairly self-explanatory. Uh, however, I will tell you that one best practice on this is going to be to usually add about a month to this estimate. So. This is important because when we're doing the estimate for the interest that's going to have to be paid during the process, it's based on the amount of months under construction. So the months to build is very important. If the builder estimates four and they take five, then that's a month worth of interest that may not already be in the account. That's going to have to be paid out of pocket. And usually that's paid by the builder. We don't want that to happen. So 
if the builder says four months, we would almost always structure that with five just to make sure that we've got a little bit of extra cushion in there just in case something goes wrong. We don't want there to be a cash out of pocket situation for anybody. Estimated as complete value. Now, because this is going to be done as a scenario, kind of at the very beginning of the process, you are not going to have an appraisal to use at this point. So how do you figure this out? Well, your estimated as complete value is basically a combination of all the costs involved. So that is your land cost, your home cost, any credits or uh, concessions the builder is going to roll into their contract with the borrower, uh, and then any contingency amount. Okay, you'll be able to get the math on that from the uh, from the scenario sheet. It's uh, well, we'll go over the contingencies when we go through the products, but the contingency can be found on there. Take all those, add them together, add about 8%, give or take, that's going to put you pretty close to the ballpark. You always want this number to be as high as possible, but as low as possible as well. <laughs> so you actually want it to be just high enough to get the project to work, low enough that it's not out of the ordinary. Okay, so basically when you're doing this, you don't want to overshoot your appraisal amount. We did have one situation where somebody had done a scenario and it got all the way through the through the processing part of it before we realized that they had overshot their scenario by their appraisal by almost $115,000. You don't want that to end up happening to you. So you want to be it has to be high enough to make the deal work, low enough to make sure it's going to be right uh, okay for the area. Uh, and I do see the questions, so I'll jump into those here in just a second once I finish up this page. Finally, EMD regular closing costs and prepays. EMD is fairly self-explanatory, uh, just any monies that are currently out there and in play. So if there's been a deposit to the builder, contractor, land seller, whoever it happens to be, any, uh, basically any, any monies that have been put out there as a deposit. Okay, and then regular closing costs and prepaids. This one tends to trip people up a little bit. Most people overthink this one. Basically, if you had a $300,000 construction loan walk into your door, and you were trying to figure out what closing costs and prepaids we were looking for, all we're really looking for is what you would normally charge if that was a regular $300,000 loan. Doesn't matter that it's construction, doesn't matter that it's proposed construction, doesn't matter any of that. We just want to know what you would charge regular closing costs and prepaids on a loan, regular loan, of the same amount. So that's what we're looking for there. Do not try to roll anything in. You don't have to calculate anything. It's just a very, very easy thing to come up with. Once all that's said and done, it gets sent into the construction resource team at construction resource team at FGMC.com. So once that's all said and done, that's been submitted to us, we can then prepare the loan builder. That's what we're going to talk about next. But let me go ahead and jump into these questions here. Uh, insurance during construction, builder paid or buyer paid. Um, there's actually kind of multiple parts to that. Uh, if you're referring to the builder's risk, okay, that's basically the, the, the coverage for the job site or the coverage for the home itself it can actually be carried by either the builder or the borrower. If it's carried by the builder, it's usually held under a builder's risk blanket policy, meaning that the builder has a policy that they then add projects to. Uh, that's a builder that's a builder held builder's risk policy. Okay. With the borrower paid policy, it actually is an HOI policy, regular HOI policy, with a course of construction rider. Okay. So basically what it is is a builder's risk insurance policy that converts to a standard HOI policy at the end. So that would be a borrower paid. Uh, it's actually more up to the builder than it is anything else. The builder can either cover it or they don't. Um, so it, it's that, at that point, there really is nothing else to, to go over. Uh, it, either they do or they don't. And if, it, if they don't, it's on the borrower. If they do, it goes under their policy. Uh, then the next question is, how do you calculate the interest? Is there a formula you use? Yes, there is a formula that we use for it. Um, it's kind of long and involved, but the ultimate uh, result of that is that we base our calculations on 70%. Okay, so we always assume that every single month that there's 70% of this construction escrow that has been withdrawn. So that is, we base that on 6.5% interest only payments. Okay, and then that is extrapolated out over the months under construction. So that's sort of the overall for how it's figured out. Uh, we're, I mean, it's built into the loan builder. The actual formula is built into the loan builder. It's not something you would ever really have to use. Uh, if you really actually wanted to know the, the full formula for it, I could always give that to you, but uh, that is sort of the gist of it. So that's how we are, we're going to calculate the interest. It's based on 70% outstanding, 6.5% interest only extrapolated out over the months under construction. Uh, and then, Greg, you had asked, uh, will you be covering the challenges with TRID regarding the LE? 
Uh, not under this presentation, but the nice thing is we've actually made a lot of changes to this program in advance of trade. So the nice thing is, and, and usually I cover this a little later on in the, in the presentation, but we'll talk about it now, uh, that the way that these are structured, there's actually nothing to disclose on what used to be the GFB tiller HUD. Okay. Now also that then carries over to the LE, and I'll explain why that is as we get into the products themselves, but you're really not going to notice a change on this one. I mean, you're going to have your change from your standard, uh, you know, your HUD and your till and such. You're going to see the change from that. But as far as how these are disclosed, it really isn't much of a change at all. We actually made that change uh, a few months back, actually, uh, to make sure that we would be in TRID compliance going through this. All righty. So once the scenario is... Webinar. Um, oh. What time close is on the training? I got one. There we go. <laughs> and one unmuted there. Sorry about that. So once the scenario sheet is done, you're going to submit this to the construction resource team. We now generate the loan builder for you. So that's what we're going to talk about next. Now, when you get the loan builder back, there's actually about six pages total. Okay, now that's going to come back every time that you do a scenario request. Now the first page that's really going to matter to you is going to be the transaction summary page. Typically this is the second page in the attachment that we send you. So we're going to walk through this real quick so you understand how to read it. Now, there is, I also have a guide for this. So when you get these loan builders back, there is a reference guide that goes along with that that will tell you line by line, section by section, what every single number on this thing means. But we're going to go over it really quick here. Okay, so starting off here, you're going to have your cost basis. Now, when you're figuring out your LTV on these, you're going to base it off of one of two numbers. One is going to be either the total cost basis. <clears throat> the second is going to be your appraised value. Whichever is the lower of those two numbers will be the basis for your LTV. So let's take a look at this. So we've got 45000 in land value, 194 241 in an adjusted builder cost, 9500 contingency, so our total cost was 248741 Appraised value, we've estimated at 250 so we're going to use that 248741 So jumping down here into the sources and credits, the way you need to think about this section is that these are all the monies that we have available within this transaction to use. So we have a loan amount of 223,685, and that's based on 89.93% LTV. Yes, there is a reason that LTV is as funky as it is, and I'll tell you why that is in a second. Uh, we also have $3,000 to use in a builder closing cost contribution, so our total fund sources and credits 226,685. That's how much we have available for this deal. Now we go up to funds required. What do we have that we need for this deal? Okay, well we need 14,000 to pay off the land. We need 194, 241 to pay the builder. 95 to be held in the contingency. We're going to talk more about the contingency later on, by the way. Closing costs 5171, prepaid 3773. So we need a grand total of 226,685. So literally, the difference between your funds required and your sources and credits is going to be your estimated cash to close. Now, in this particular situation, you can see that that is zero dollars. So how did that happen? Okay, well, we take into account the lot equity. So on FHA and conventional loans, you're able to use the lot equity to offset your cash to close. You're able to use that as, as part of your contribution to pay for uh, prepaid closing costs, so on and so forth. So if we were to use a 96.5% LTV on this, you would actually have gotten cash back to the borrower. Well, since that can never happen, we can never have cash going back to the borrower. We then lowered the LTV until that number became zero. Okay, so we could have done this as a 96 and a half, but it would have resulted in money back. Okay, to get that money to zero, to make sure the borrower didn't get anything back but didn't owe anything, that's where the 89.93% LTV came from, and that's why we've used such an odd number. So below that, you'll see that there's a contingency meets the minimum requirement, and who's responsible to pay for what during the process. Okay, it's going to be the builder. So that is the transaction summary screen. This right here is your skeleton. Okay? This is the basis for your loan. Pretty much all the numbers that you'll need for this come directly from this transaction summary screen. So the next one I'm going to show you is the builder screen. So this is basically a calculations page that we've come up with specifically for the builder. The builder does not care about 90% of what we've just talked about. The builder really only cares, what do I need to write my contract for? What is the net? What do I need to include? That's exactly what we've boiled this form down to. So you can see, in this particular example, we've got $190,000 cost of construction. 
that's what it's going to cost to build the home. Now, the builder had already planned to pay $3,000 in credit. The builder had already planned to pay the $53.52 in soft costs. So we're not going to adjust the price for that. They, however, did not anticipate paying the $42.41 in interest. So the builder says to us, then I would like to increase my contract price to account for that. So it's not coming out of my profit. Okay. So then what the adjusted builder contract price would be would be $194,241. 190 plus the interest. The builder would then net 181,648. Now you always have the option to roll in your soft costs and prepaid credit as well, just they're not required to do so. Now this can be given directly to the builders. It's not something you have to hold, it's not proprietary. This can be given directly to them so they can see exactly which line items they need, what their net's going to be, and what their contract should be. Next up, this should look pretty familiar. This is actually just the details of transaction from page 3 of the 1003. So this actually pulls all of the numbers from the transaction summary screen, puts them into a mock 1003 details of transaction, and basically just gives you the format. So as long as you copied the numbers directly out of this into your 1003 page 3, you will be perfectly fine. It should mirror ours completely. So this is just in here as a reference guide for you folks to use when you are filling out your 1003 page 3. The last two pages that you're going to see are the appraisal order cover sheet and the schedule of fees. Okay, starting with the schedule of fees. When you hear me refer to the term soft costs, okay, these are the construction loan charges and fees. Okay, so this is where this comes into play. The soft costs are a combination of your construction loan fee, underwriting, draw administration, closing and dock coordination, your, your draw inspections, title updates, and if you do happen to be using a third-party document prep company, uh, you can put that in there as well. Uh, MRG is just an example one. So, total construction soft costs, 5352 There's very little reason you would ever have to deal with these on an individual basis. Uh, usually it's just dealt with as the entire number of total soft costs. The last page is going to be the appraisal order cover sheet. Now, the appraisal order cover sheet should be used when you're ordering the appraisal, so you'll send this over as well. This gives you what the, the land cost, the estimated value would be on the land, uh, the projected construction costs, and the, uh, the estimated contingency. So you would actually take this along with the builder's contract and cost breakdown. That gets forwarded over to the appraiser. The appraiser puts that all together into what's called an as-complete or plans and specs appraisal. Uh, it's going to be based on the existing land value plus the, the home to be built. So it's a future value for what the home will be worth when it's all said and done. So anytime that you send in one of those scenario request forms, you're going to get all those forms back. Okay, that'll all be sent to you as a PDF attachment. So now, your borrowers have sat down, you've done the initial scenario request, you've sent that in, we've structured the loan for you, and we've sent your loan builder back. What do you do with it at this point? Okay, well, next up, you're just going to review the entire thing with your clients. Okay, make sure the borrower's comfortable with what their cash out of pocket looks like, make sure they're comfortable with their payment. You want to also check with the builder, make sure that they're comfortable with their net, make sure that they are comfortable with what they're including and what they need to write their contract for. At that point, everybody is on the same page. Okay, now if you haven't done so at this point, you would want to send in your builder acceptance package. Okay, that needs to come into builder review at fgmc.com so we can go ahead and get them through the acceptance process. You're going to go ahead and take the initial loan application just like you normally would. You're going to order your appraisal using the cover sheet that we provide. And then a loan is going to be submitted. Now, when it comes to pricing these, it's going to be a little bit different situation whether you're correspondent or whether you're wholesale. If you happen to be a wholesale submission, you can actually get your pricing directly off the website. There is a link on there to actually sign up for the daily rate sheets. Those rate sheets will be sent directly to you. If you are a correspondent, it is a little bit different. Okay? As a correspondent, you're going to have to work with your secondary department. Basically, when we set up pricing for the one-time closed construction, they have specific rate sheets. Okay, I am not able to send you specific rate sheets for those because they have not gone through your secondary department's pricing model. Okay, whenever we send them information, they, they apply their pricing voodoo, and then they send it out to you guys in the field. So we cannot do direct distribution rate sheets like that. So you would want to work with your secondary department. If your secondary department is not already getting them for some reason, then please work with your FGMC account executive to address that. They can go ahead and get your secondary department set up to receive them, and then they can apply their pricing. Uh, okay, so we did have a question come in. Can we pick the title company to do issue draws and title updates? Construction fund is held by First Guarantee. 
Uh, First Guarantee does hold the construction fund. We also issue the draws. We also perform the inspections. Uh, the title updates, I believe, is done by the title company that did the closing. I would have to verify that one. Uh, but the actual inspections, draws, and everything are ordered through us. Uh, and we actually held, hold the escrow. But the title updates, I'd have to confirm just to make sure it's the title company that closed it. Uh, and then we also have the question, uh, how long does the process take? Now, uh, Greg, when you're talking about the process, are you talking about from submission to close? Or are you talking about a certain part of the process? Oh, just the draw itself. Oh, the draw itself is actually pretty quick. Um, from the time of submission to the time the borrower or the borrower, the builder gets a check, um, five to seven days, give or take. It's not long. It's it's not a, a drawn out process. So it, I know I've heard some horror stories out there of builders waiting a month or two for draws. No, ours is pretty close. I mean, ours is pretty quick. Um, you know, I'd say five to seven, and a lot of times it's actually less than that. But five to seven is the safe number. So. Now that you've gotten everything done, you've submitted the package, it's now in our ballgame. Okay? So at this point, we're going to start with the builder acceptance review. Okay? Now, the whole reason we do this is really just as a quick risk analysis on the builder. We need to make sure that we're comfortable as a company with their builder's financial wherewithal to complete the project. So there's a few things that we need to look for on here. Okay? But then we're going to need their profile, their license, insurance, a couple items that we the, the builder acceptance package that we'll provide you. Uh, is going to have that information in there. They'll just provide their license and insurance. A couple things that we look for. Okay, so how long have they been in business and who are the principals of the company? The other items we look for, project history and current projects. Now this one is important because project history and current projects, if you've got a builder that has averaged three to five homes a year for the last five years, and all of a sudden they've got 15 in process at the same time, we may need a letter of explanation saying, hey, you grew your business exponentially over the last year. How were you able to do that? So that's why that's going to be important there. Under the references, we need supplier, subcontractor, and previous project. Now, on the builder acceptance package, there are spaces on there for three of each of those. I highly encourage you as a lender, and as a lender to encourage the builder to provide three for each. We may only need a certain combination of a few, but the more we have to call, the better chance we have of getting that cleared for you. So that's one part of this you don't want to undershare. Always include as many references as possible. Business financials. Now, this is only going to be required on the stick-built modular builders. Okay, We don't actually require this on manufactured, but this is going to take the shape of your W-2s, first couple pages from the last two years, uh, your S-Corps, depending on how you file, P&L, balance sheet, probably some combination thereof. Again, this is done as a snapshot. So one thing to keep in mind is that any builder that we have submitted for acceptance is going to go through a LexisNexis check. This is a business-to-business -business background check for looking for financials. Okay, It's not going to give us a whole lot of information, but it will tell us about any tax judgments or liens against the builder and any, re any credit information that is public record. The rule of thumb basically has been that the larger the builder, the less we'll probably need directly from them. So you have somebody like Kahov, Toll Brothers, Beezer, some major national builder. Uh, they're probably going to have a lot of information on their Lexus stuff, a lot of public information. Okay, might not need as much directly from them. But the flip side of that is that if you have like Dave's scuba diving and home building, uh, we may need to dig into them a little further because chances are they're not going to have as much uh, as, as much in terms of public knowledge. Finally, draws and disbursements. We need to know how many draws they're expecting or how many times they expect to be paid during the process and how they would want that money sent out. Okay, so that constitutes the builder acceptance review. Now, again, this is not designed to run them through the ringer. This is not designed to be onerous. And I can tell you that out of probably 600 builders that we've had submitted, I think six have been declined. Uh, it really has to be something fairly egregious for us to not accept a builder. But always make sure you get that in as early as possible. All right, a couple questions we have here. Uh, when sending a draw to the builder, can it be done via wire transfer? I believe wire transfer is one of our options, uh, Pam. So I'll, I'll verify that, but I'm almost positive it is. Uh, let's see. Will we get a copy of the slides by email? Absolutely. Monica, as long as your email address is in your GoToMeeting profile, uh, or you've sent it to me by private message, one way or the other, I will go ahead and get those out to you. Uh, let's see. In theory, we would have all points of info to generate an app upon submitting the scenario request form, but we would not actually take an app until we receive the Loan Builder tool. Particularly with TRID, I'm wondering if this has been clarified by FGMC. I know our compliance department is curious about this. Uh, Chad, that's a great question. Um, 
get with me after the call, and uh, I'm gonna we'll see if we can get that addressed for you. Because I'm not 100% sure how the scenario plays into that, uh, but it may need to be researched a little bit. Um, but I can certainly get with you after the call on that one. Uh, let's see. Builder, whoa, lots of questions coming in. Okay, builder business tax returns for two years. It's the first two pages for the last two years. Yes, Greg. Um, and then how often do we need to update builder data once a year? Um, builder data will actually be updated. If you like, Let's say you've done a pre-acceptance. Okay, you, you've set one in, and then you've got your first deal. Anytime that you send in a deal, we're going to then update the license and insurance, make sure that it's still current. Um, it's not something that you would have to do, generally speaking. Uh, it's going to be something that we would do on our end if we looked at the builder and said, oh, hey, their license is up. We need to go ahead and get the, their new license information. Not something you would really have to do on your end. Now, we may engage you to help us to get it if, if we can't get a hold of the builder, but for the most part, that should be on our end. And then who pulls the business credit report for the builder? That is going to be us. Uh, and keep in mind, Greg, it's not actually – it's not a true credit report. LexisNexis is really just used. It's just a business-to-business -business search to look for public information. It's not like a. It's not like pulling an Equifax. It's it's just a sort of general search. Uh, really, it just lets us know of any tax liens, judgments on them, and then anything that they've posted publicly. So it's not it's not like an in-depth credit score type report. Uh, it is much much more abbreviated than that. We don't we don't go into the pulling a, pulling a full report on anybody. So. So that covers the, the builder acceptance review. Okay, now one little quick note here on the draw schedules. One sort of difference that FGMC has versus some other lenders is that the draw schedules are actually pretty flexible. Okay, so basically some lenders will, will say to a builder, uh, you know, hey, we need you to, you're only going to get three draws, you're only going to get this much money per draw, whatever it is. We, we, they have very set guidelines for what the draws can entail. Uh, we actually don't do that. We work hand-in-hand -hand with the builder to figure out what's going to be the best draw schedule for them. Uh, so this can usually come in the form of one or two different ways. You'll see this done as a line item draw schedule or a stage draw. Okay, Line item is actually each item has a, has a line item cost. Stage draw, there is a series of items that have to be completed before a percentage is dispersed. So line item can, is a little bit more flexible for the builder because okay, they can actually get you know line item draws or even partial line item draws. Stage building is a little bit different. Stage, you have to have a whole series of things completed before you would get one bulk payment of money. So we allow for either one. Line item is fine. Draw, or, uh, stage draws are fine. We allow up to a max of nine draws. Uh, it, it's you know there, There's some flexibility in there. So we'll work with the builders to come up with, with, uh, with what works best for them. Uh, and then for the my email address to request a copy of the slides, I can certainly put that in there for you. Uh, but as long as I have your email address, you will get a copy after the presentation. But I will certainly go ahead and put mine in here for you as well. Uh, and then the business financials, Heidi, if you missed it, it was the, uh, the W-2s, first two pages, P&L, balance sheet, or internally prepared uh, documents, or some combination thereof. So that sort of gives you the, 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 or the, the basis for what we would use. There may be some flexibility in there depending on what they have available, uh, but that's the basics. So that covers us for the builder acceptance and the draw schedules. Now, jumping over into the actual project review side of things. Okay, this is the point that we would actually look at the appraisal, make sure that we have the as complete or subject to appraisal. Now again, if you're not familiar with construction and renovation lending, this is done as a plans and specs. Okay, so this is a combination of the contract, the plans and specs for the proposed build, forwarded to the appraisal company to combine with the existing land value. That is a subject to future value plans and specs appraisal. That's how all construction and renovation is done. The construction contract, okay, we need to make sure that we've got a, a signed purchase agreement between the builder and the borrower, because really without that we don't have anything. Uh, the plans and specs for the home, and then the draw schedule and cost breakdown. So this is going to be a little bit more detailed version. This is where they're actually going to outline the various steps. So the draw schedule may indicate, uh, you know, hey, we're paying 10% here, 15% there, 15% here, so on and so forth. The cost breakdown is where everything would actually be lined out, so we have an idea of what everything costs. Okay, this is where the builder would take and do, okay, you're framing your trusses, your roof sheathing, then your exterior sheathing, then you're on the rough trade, drywall, so on and so forth. So this is where those costs would be broken out. Some builders do it with labor, labor and material, some don't. Not the, not the end of the world to do it either way. 
So that's what we're looking for when it comes to the draw schedule and cost breakdown. Again, that's the more detailed version of their build. So the next two slides that you're going to see here, I am by no means going to sit here and read you line by line because I generally have more respect for your time than that. But uh, we do have the manufactured modular and site built home submission checklist. This is really just to show you that there are a few differences between the two, or between the three, actually, now. That a lot of these forms overlap, but there are specific ones to the construction type. You want to make sure that you're using the correct ones for your construction type. I said a lot of them overlap, some of them don't. So always make sure that you use the correct one. One other thing that I want to show you on this screen, and when you heard me refer at the beginning to that construction resource team initial review, <clears throat> This is what we're actually looking for. So this top section here, this top three documents, these are what my team would be looking for when you send in the file. Okay, So they're looking for a completed loan builder. They are looking for the lot and land acquisition. So that's either going to be a lot contract or you're going to have the lien value and uh, or the lien and value information. And then we need to make sure that we have the home for, or sorry, the contract for the home, the purchase agreement for the home. Those three things, or what my team is looking for when this is sent in for an initial structure, or when it's, uh, as an initial submission. So everything else that you see on here, all these other documents, these are the secondary documents. Okay, now while these still, new, these still do need to be done, these do not necessarily need to accompany your initial submission. These do need to be uploaded prior to the issuance of a CTC. So you, do want to, you don't really want to waste time getting these in, but they do not necessarily need to come in with the initial submission. Some of these are signed by the builder, some are signed by the borrower, some are signed by both. Okay, so you may have a little bit longer time getting these together. These, as, when you get them, should be uploaded just like conditions. Okay, so they should, be, they should be uploaded through the portal just like conditions. If they get sent in via email, a lot of times they get lost. So you don't want that to happen. You want to go ahead and submit that just like a condition would be through the uh, through the portal. So this is just to show you that there is a difference here between those two. Uh, again, this is a this is a copy of something that you are going to get. You are going to get your individual construction packages. Okay, so uh, nothing to nothing really to worry about on there. But just to show you that there is a difference, so that you're aware of that, you're looking for the correct package. Uh, now we did have the question come in. Uh, I guess, do we allow the borrower to pay the interest during the construction period? Uh, the answer to that, Gerardo, is no. Uh, at this point, everything has to be built into the builder's sales contract. We do not allow the borrower to pay the interest separately. There is a reason for this. Basically, there are two things that can stop a builder from getting a draw. The first is that they didn't do the work, and that's on them. Okay, you know, If they didn't do the work, they don't get paid. That's a pretty easy one. The second reason is that the borrower did not make their monthly interest payment. Okay, So we would then have to hold the draw to the builder until the borrower was able to make the payment. Well, we at First Guarantee guarantee the builder is going to be finished, is going to deliver a finished home. There is no chance during the process for that draw to be withheld for any reason other than builder non-performance. What that allows us to do is say to the builder, FGMC will guarantee the completion of this home. It does not matter if the borrower spontaneously combusts in the middle of I-95. We will complete this home. The builder will not be on the hook. So in order to do that for the builders, we need to make sure that we collect the interest and hold it in escrow. The interest payments are made by us. There is no chance for the builder to not get a draw because of a non-interest payment. So hopefully that clears up exactly why we do it. Uh, but no, we actually have to structure everything into the loan drawer. All right, next up we're going to talk about the various phases of this project. Okay, there are really only two. We've got the construction phase and the permanent phase. So starting with the construction phase, uh, first of all, I'll say that there are no PITI payments to be made during this process. You can't really have a PITI, a PITI payment on something that doesn't exist. So there are payments due during the construction process, and we've sort of just touched on this a little bit, but these are going to be interest only and based on the drawn balance. Okay, so those interest payments do have to be made every month. They are made by our internal draw administration staff. They are never handled by the borrower. The rate for this currently is 6.5%. Again, this is interest only. It is on the drawn balance only. It has nothing to do with the qualifying rate for your borrower. Okay, so don't confuse this rate with the qualifying rate. That is a different animal. 
Okay, the builder is going to be responsible for the interest in the soft cost, but keep in mind they always have the option to increase their contract price. So if they're, you know, if they've said their home is two hundred thousand to build, we've calculated for twelve thousand in cost. They can write their contract for two twelve. It is not a requirement. They do not have to do that. Most builders tend to. So that is the construction phase. Now, in terms of the permanent phase, this is where we're going to talk a little bit more about those cap and or the uh, the rate locks. Okay, we have the cap and float down, we have the extended lock. Those are the two that we have available. First of all, both of these are based on nine month construction periods. Both of these are also extendable out to 12 months uh, with an extension fee. Now, if you do happen to have a loan or a home that's going to take longer than nine months and you know that from the outset, please let us know in advance. We may be able to work with you on that. Okay, but that is the standard, nine months with an extension out to 12, about a half point extension per month. So, starting with cap and float down, this one is actually a 60-day lock. This one only needs to cover you up through the closing. Okay? At that point, it becomes a floating rate. Uh, it then modifies, at the end of the process, into the permanent rate. So let's do an example here. Okay, so let's say you chose 5% at 102. That was your, your rate and your pricing for it. Now, please don't take me at that. That is, has nothing to do with today's pricing, and these are numbers pulled out of the air. So 5% at 102 that would become your capped rate. The rate could never go above that. So that would then become your qualifying rate also, because that is the highest the rate could ever be. So once we go to closing, the rate becomes floating. Now the floating rate can go up, it can go down, it will have no bearing whatsoever on the borrower. The day that we get to modification, which is really the day this thing becomes a permanent loan, we are then going to go look at the rate sheets for that day, and find out what the closest associated rate to 102 is. Now, if 102 buys you 4.5, then great, the borrower gets a 4.5% interest rate. If 102 now buys you 5.5, well, the borrower still only gets their 5, okay, because that can never be higher than that. That was the very, very top of what they could be in a rate. So, it's like an insurance policy. The rate can go down, it can never go up. They're qualified at, at the most their rate could ever be. Keep that, keeping this in mind, too, that let's say you chose 5% as your capped rate, and everything stayed static throughout the course of the build. Okay? Your rate would actually modify a little closer to 4 and a quarter. The modification rates generally run about 3 quarters of a percent lower than the capped rate. So, and again, that's assuming everything stays static. Now, pricing could change, of course, but in a perfect world, if everything stayed exactly the same, you'd modify it about 3 quarters of a percent lower. So that is the cap and float down. Uh, then you've got the straight extended lock. This is a pretty simple one. This is literally just you're locking in the rate today through the entirety of the construction process. The difference really here is that you're going to have to be careful when these lock. Okay, With the cap and float down, it's a 60-day lock, so that it really only needs to cover you up through the closing. Pretty easy one to time. <clears throat> the extended lock, however, needs to cover you up through closing and all the way through the construction period. So you need to make sure that you've built in yourself enough time. If you've got a four-month lock and the builder says it takes four months to build the home, but it then takes us two more weeks to get through the process of the of the file. <clears throat> well you've eaten up two months out of your lock or two weeks out of your lock. So you don't want that to happen. Okay, so you want to keep that in mind as to when you're locking it and how long you're locking it for. It has to be enough to cover the entirety of the process plus the construction. So keep that in mind. You always want to look at the pricing for both of these. Generally speaking the, the extended lock is a little bit higher priced product. Uh, but every once in a while with the right coupon discount application to the rates, uh, they can be a little bit different. They can actually flip the other way around. It doesn't happen very often, but you always want to make sure that you check both. So those are the two rate block options that we have currently. Okay? I would say the cap and float down is by far the more popular option at this point, but we do still offer the extended lock for your more meticulous buyer. Uh, an extended rate lock sounds like it can be a challenge if an extension is required. <clears throat> Won't that mess up the trade restrictions? Uh, Greg, good question. I'll have to look into finding out what the trade restrictions are on the rate locks. Um, you know, whether or not the, the standard extension model would still apply here, but I will certainly find out for you. And, it, you know, if that's the case, it may end up, we, we may end up doing away with the extended lock if that becomes an issue. So the cap and float down fits well within the process of trade. Uh, the extended lock has always been offered as a secondary option, so, uh, you know, who knows? If we get it reviewed and it's, it's actually going to mess up the trade restrictions, then it'll probably go away. But uh, for right now, we are still offering both. 
The next screen that you see here, this is basically in here just as sort of a reminder. This is a form that we get sent in, and it's wrong about 50% of the time. Uh, you just want to make sure that everything on here is filled out completely. Okay, you want to make sure that yes, you've filled out the top of section information with all, all the originator information and the borrower information, but you also want to make sure that you fill in the various sections down here. Okay, you want to make sure that you check the correct box for the rate lock that you want to use, and then fill out the information for that particular rate lock. You have to fill out the section up top, you have to fill out one of these sections down here, and you have to select one of the sections down here. Just make sure that you're filling this out completely. So, jumping in here to the products, we're going to start here with FHA. Uh, now, we do allow this one to go to 96.5% on the LTV. It does require a 580 or better on the credit score. Now, there is an option to do one-time close if you've got a 530 to 579, and that's going to be the 90% uh, LTV. Okay, so. If you've got a 530 to 579, there's still a home for it. You do have 90% LTV availability on that one. To do max financing, you need to be at a 580 or better. We do allow manufactured, modular, and stick built across the board on these. Okay, that's going to be for all the loan types. Uh, they also have the same contingency requirement. So 5% or $7,500, whichever is more, on the stick belts. 3000 on the modulars and manufacturers. Quick note here on the contingencies. Okay, a couple things. The contingencies, number one, are in there for two different reasons. The first is going to be for any cost overruns. Okay, so the best example I can give you here is that if a builder has to put in a well, they dig down 10 feet and realize that they've hit solid rock. Okay, well now they have to blast. That's going to cost more money. If we have contingency funds available, we can move it over, we can pay out the, the, the blasting company, we're good to go. No, no stoppage, no harm, no foul. If we don't have it, it's a cash out of pocket situation, which again, we're trying to avoid. The second reason that it's in there is for any borrower-initiated change orders. Okay, keep in mind that this loan has closed by the time the construction starts. So whatever selections the borrower have made are in place at that point. So let's say they went to the flooring center and picked out level two carpet and pad, and that's you know that that's what's going to go into the house. Right before it gets ready to be installed, they go, God, I really wish we'd have picked that level three carpet and pad. Well, if we've got the contingency in there, we can move the money over, pay for the upgraded carpet and pad, we move forward, no harm, no foul. If we don't have it in there, it's going to be, a, it's going to be again, a cash out of pocket situation. And a lot of times when borrowers are building these homes, they don't have an extra $4,000 laying around to pay off for new carpet. So we have the contingency in there for that reason as well, to make sure that if they have any changes, they're able to do that. Now on these, the builder is going to handle the construction period costs. That's going to be your interest, your construction loan fees, uh, and then any title updates and inspections that come along with that, with their draw requests. Keep in mind also that if, when these are included in the builder sales contract, they will not count against your max seller concessions. So even though you've included these costs in the contract, the builder still has an extra 6% to play with if they would like to do a contribution. So just keep in mind, they do not count against your max seller concessions. For FHA, your loan amount is going to follow whatever the FHA limit is for your particular area, and then these are considered purchases from an MI and LTV perspective. That is the FHA. Jumping over into VA, now we do allow up to 100% on these, but there is one thing you have to keep in mind, and that is that VA does not recognize lot equity the same way that FHA and, VA, or FHA and conventional do. On FHA and conventional, kind of like I showed you in the example there, you're able to use lot equity to offset your closing costs, prepaids, cash out of pocket. VA does not allow you to do that. VA considers that to be equity stripping. So, looking at lot equity on VA, you can use it only to pay down the funding fee. That is the only thing that lot equity can ever be used for is to pay the funding fee. Nothing else. Now, as far as the seasoning requirements go, on FHA, there is a six-month requirement to use the value on the land. Otherwise, we'd have to go off the purchase price. Uh, conventional, there is no seasoning requirement whatsoever. You can buy it today and use it tomorrow. But keep in mind, VA does not allow you to use lot equity the same way. We do allow manufactured modular and stick. Again, same contingency requirement, 5% or 7,500 on stick, 3,000 modular and manufactured. Again, the builder is going to handle the interest during the construction, the construction loan fees, 
title updates, real estate taxes, going, so on and so forth, they're all included. Again, keep in mind that if they are billed or paid construction costs, they do not count against the seller concessions. One thing also to note, and this sort of touches back on that LE question from the beginning. Keep in mind this was designed uh, off of the old system, of course. So whenever those fees are rolled into the builder sales contract, there is nothing to disclose. You, you know, Previously, it would have been on GFE, TIL, and HUD. Currently, there will be nothing to disclose on your LE. The disclosures for a construction to perm loan should look the same as a purchase because they've been built into the contract. None of them are direct charges to the borrower. They are charged through the builder contract to the borrower, but that is not the same thing. Okay, so they do not need to be disclosed. Uh, also, the question come in, what is the lot seasoning? You mentioned VA has six months, conventional is none. Uh, actually, FHA was six months, conventional is none. The seasoning, repair, the seasoning period is the amount of time it takes before we can use the appraised value of a lot as opposed to the purchase price. So if the lot was 30000 it's now worth 40000 but you've owned it less than six months, we'd have to use the 30000 on FHA. If the lot was 30000 and worth 40000 on conventional, we could use the 40000 because there is no, there is no seasoning requirement. So, yeah, it's just the length of time before we're able to use appraised value versus purchase price. Finally, we're going to finish up here with conventional as the last product we have. This one is a little bit different, too. Um, this one, the LTV is going to be capped at 70%. Now, there is a reason for this, and that is that once you get above 70% LTV or below a 700 credit score, Fannie requires you to requalify at the end of the loan. Well, that then becomes a two-time close. Okay, so in order to keep this in the bounds of a one-time close product, we need to make sure that that LTV is 70% or less, credit scores are 70 or 700 or more. So anything deviating from that, if you're under 700 or over 70% LTV, it's going to be a two-time close. That is a product that we don't offer. So again, keeping this with a true one-time close, we keep those limits. None of these products are set up to do investment properties. However, this is the only one that will allow you to do a second home. Now, you're still going to have to follow the second home guidelines from Fannie, but this is the only construction project or product that will allow you to do a second home. Same contingency requirement, 5% or $7,500 on the stick, $3,000 for modular and manufactured. Again, the builder is going to handle the costs. They do not count towards your max seller concessions, and they are not going to be disclosed on your LE. Another difference here, just in terms of the conventional, okay, these do have to come in with a DU approved eligible. There's no manual underwrites on these. FHA and VA allow you to get in with the, you know, with the approved, uh, with the approved refer uh, any, or refer eligible. Uh, this one does have to come in with an approved eligible. There's no room on conventional to, to do a manual. And then LTV on the conventional, the same for primary and second home, correct? Uh, yeah, actually the requirement I think technically is 80% on a second home, but in order to keep it within the bounds of a one-time close, it's going to have to match the 70 anyway. So yeah, the LTV would be the same regardless. So just to sort of finish up here with you guys, um, we do have the construction resource team. Again, that's my group here. We are here to operate as the backstop and safety net for you guys on these loans. We want to make sure that you understand this product. Okay, so if you ever have any questions about if something is allowed, something will qualify, how to calculate something, what should this number be, please let us know. We are here to help you with these loans. We are here as a resource. Okay, we want you to sort of take the Henry Ford approach here. You don't have to know everything about the product. You just need to know who does. Well, we're the ones that do. So please make sure that you use this as a resource. Um, and, of course, I know we've got some questions in here regarding TRID that we're going to have to get answered up, but, again, we will get those answered and taken care of. So that's exactly what you have the construction resource team here for. Um, you know, please, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out and contact us. So a little quick overview here for you. Again, your loan builder calculations, you want to get that scenario sheet sent in to us first. That should always be number one. The builder acceptance package gets sent in. That should get sent to builder review at fgmc.com. You're going to register and upload your loan through the portal, just like a normal loan would be. It goes through the various underwriting processes. We're going to get the submissions uh, collected and cleared up, and then that goes into closing. So 
I'm going to leave this last screen up here for you, which has got our email addresses on here. Um, that is the end of the presentation for today, guys. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I greatly appreciate it. I hope you learned something coming out of this. Um, if you do have any questions or anything, I will certainly stay on the line here for you. If you do not have any questions, I just want to say thank you, and I appreciate your time, and we look forward to your first submissions. Uh, but I will address any questions that have come up at this, uh, that are going to come in at this point. Um, then, did the question come in? Will you be emailing any information that you got back in regards to the TRID questions? Um, yeah, I can certainly take down the information here uh, and let everybody know what the answer is on that. It may not be today. We're going to have to get with my compliance department to, to verify some stuff but I can certainly send that out, sure. Uh, are we sure we have second home for conventional? Yes, we are currently offering second home for conventional. Uh, will you be using the LE for all broker wholesale loans? I would assume so. Um, you know, if you, your account executive may have, if, you've done, if you're doing wholesale, uh, your account executive may be getting with you shortly to, to go over that. But um, as far as I know, we're, uh, as far as I know, the LE will be issued. Yeah, by, I believe it's actually going to be by us. But uh, that your, your AE would be able to give you a little bit better direction as to. Oh, sorry. Yes, us issuing it. I'm sorry. Yes, issuing it from us. Um, I said, hopefully your account executive will fill you in on that one a little bit more as to how that process is going to work. But yeah, we should be. The, I believe we're the ones issuing it. Uh, Sandy, who's your AE? I'll make sure I get in touch with him. Okay, I'll check with him. I'm not sure where that came up, but uh, if you know, unless there's something I don't know, which I, I would be surprised, but I, I will go ahead and check with them. So can we go over the part about wholesale lenders versus correspondents? Sure. Um, it really, this is it's going to come down to your pricing for the most part. Um, Wholesale and corresponding get their pricing from slightly different places. As a wholesaler broker, uh, you're actually going to get your pricing from our website. You can actually go to our website and sign up for the daily rate sheets. They just come directly to your email. That's super. That's simple. Correspondent side is a little bit different because correspondent usually gets pricing applied by your secondary department prior to it going to you. So that prevents us from being able to send pricing directly to you. Usually we have to go through your secondary department. So they're going to have to apply their pricing voodoo, and then they'll send it out to, to you guys in the field. So that's the, when you're getting pricing for your correspondent side, you check with your secondary department first. If they are not getting the rate sheets from FGMC, please work with your account executive, and they can go ahead and get you set up to receive those. Um, normally, we, we do that on a company-by-company -company basis. So you know, if, if one person in your company gets it, everybody should be able to have access to it. So that's really sort of the major difference. Uh, the other difference is in how it actually gets underwritten, or how it gets closed. Um, so that would be a, a correspondent, you would originate it, we would underwrite it, and then you would close it in your name. As a wholesale, you would originate it, we would underwrite it, we would close it in our name. So that's kind of the difference is how these would actually work through. Uh, C, I'm not sure what the C2 abbreviation is for. Uh, Laurie, is that the construction of perm? Is that what you're, you're trying to abbreviate there? Because um, if that's the case, then yes, it, it is available wholesale brokered or as a non-DAL correspondent. Uh, they're, they're available both ways. It just depends on how your company wants to submit them. Uh, then as far as FHA, is the lot equity, or if the lot equity is there, we still need 3.5% cash contribution for the loan, correct? The loan equity just adjusts the LTV. The contribution is actually taken into account when we do the loan builder. So like when I showed you that example that has zero dollars cash to close, that took the three and a half percent contribution into account. Oh, CT was the name of the financial company. Sorry about that. Um, no, it's, it, it really all depends on the agreement that you signed with FGMC, Laurie. Uh, you'll have to check with 
Ooh, either your secondary department or really or your AE, kind of the same thing for the rate sheets, but either one of them should be able to tell you what you're, how you're signed up. Uh, if you have, a, if you're really having trouble getting a hold of them or, or can't really figure it out, let me know. I might be able to dig into it for you to find out um, who your who your AE or sorry who your uh, or what your submission channel would be. Um, a lot of times, places sign up with both, so it, it really would sort of depend. Uh, I wish I had a little bit better dry answer for you there, but companies can either be wholesale or correspondent or both. So uh, just want to check with secondary or, or your AE. All right, folks, that's going to put us right at 3 o'clock here, so we're going to go ahead and sign off. Uh, you will see your uh, follow-up email coming here shortly. Uh, Sandy, I got your number there, so I'll go ahead and take care of that. And, uh, yeah, so from here on out, if you do have any questions, please make sure that you email the construction resource team. You've got the email address right up there on the screen there for you. Uh, once I send out the follow-up information, you will also have my direct contact info as well. So if you do have any questions, please make sure that you let us know. If not, thank you again for your time and attention today. I appreciate it, and we will look forward to your first submission. Thank you very much, folks. Have a good one.